All righty. And then panelists, I'm going to have you introduce yourselves in just a second. I've just put in the chat what I'm going to have y'all share. So I'm going to have you say your names, your pronouns, uh, what program, meaning front end or back end, and cohort that you went through. About how long was your job search? And then what is your current role? And Jim James, I'll have you go first. Sounds good. Um, so my name is James Millard or Jim James, uh, since I can't decide between Jim or James. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I was in the 1908 front end program and my job search was about 10 or 11 months. I graduated February and I got a job in October. And what's your current role? Oh, my current role uh, is I am a software developer for a company that is based out of Boulder, um, working in like the science and research industry. Awesome. Cool. We'll go Gavin and then Deanna. Hey, my name is Gavin. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. I was in the 2207 backend program and my jobs, I was searching for about 116 days. Um, and my current role is a software engineer at Jack in the Box. Hi all, my name is Deanna. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I did the back end program with a cohort 2203. Um, my job search was, um, I graduated at the end of September and signed an offer in at the end of April. Um, so I'm not really sure how long that is exactly. Um, and I am a customer support engineer for Fastly. Awesome. We'll go Ben and then Kyle. Hey everyone. Uh, my name is Ben. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, I was also with the 1908 front end program. My job search length is, I guess, kind of like two part. I had a really, really, really part time internship for a bit. And that was around the four month mark, I think. And then at about a year, uh, I got my first like full-time job. Uh, but my current role is at a company called Peaksware, um, kind of out of Louisville. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Kyle Barnett. My pronouns are he, him. Uh, the program I did was the front end and the cohort was 1911. Um, my job search was about six months and my current role is software engineer three at Charter. Awesome, sweet. Uh, just to give a little like summary of how this is gonna run. If you are in the audience and you have questions, especially if they feel like super related to the things that are being said, feel free to just pop those in the chat. You can raise your hand, but I think chat will help us like kind of get those questions in the queue. When you signed up for this event, you were able to post a question if you had it. So I've got those questions ready, lots of common themes. So I'm hoping we can answer a lot of those questions in this time. And then panelists, um, for y'all, I'm going to have you, I'm going to basically like call on one of you just to get us started. And then if somebody else wants to share if you're like oh I have something that I want to say go ahead and just raise your hand um so I'll probably have like a couple of you answer each question rather than all five answer every single question um cool so I'm going to get us started a lot of questions that came in were really about like how did you structure your time like what did you do with your days while you were on the job search and so that might be really vague and I'll have more specific questions later, but I just wanna start by asking about like, how did you structure your time when you were on your job search? And Deanna, I'll have you start. Sure, um, so I, it is pretty hard to balance with everything when you're trying to network, keep up your technical skills, apply for jobs, which, um, can be fast, but also can be really draining with cover letters and all that kind of thing. So um, what worked for me, what I ended up doing, um, I assume are, do you know if a lot or if students are still getting access to Hunter? The, I believe the, so. Okay. That tool was amazing. If y'all aren't using that yet for your job searches, definitely use that to keep organized. Um, but for structuring my time, I usually, I had three days a week where I would meet with a cohort mate for like a couple hours and do code challenges, practice like that. Um, I would try to 
make sure. And I was only doing this Monday through Friday. I treated my job search like Turing nine to four weekdays. Um, and I tried to do, like I said, code challenges, code work um, with a cohort made a couple times a week. I tried to get out between one and five job applications every day. Sometimes five was too many. Um, and I would just do what I was able to. And then I also tried to make sure every day I was setting aside some time for outreach, trying to figure out, make, you know, connections on LinkedIn, schedule coffee chats, that kind of thing. So that's what worked for me. Awesome. Kyle, how did you spend your time? Um, so I actually did about three different strategies. So I started off with very similar to uh, Deanna, where I was doing about, you know, three to five applications a day, cover letters, spending a lot of time on cover letters, um, reviews. I joined an organization that actually went out of business that was called Mintbean at the time, which helped polish your code skills. And then I want to say about two months in, I kind of switched gears and just started submitting as many applications as I could, only writing cover letters for the positions I was like, that's a job I absolutely want, um, just to try and do that numbers game um, to get my resume as in front of as many eyes as possible. And then towards the end, it really just became a numbers game. I kind of like, I don't know, my mental health was totally deteriorating. It became really hard, which I think is, you know, I started having to readjust and do more self-care. So I had a lot less time to like do cover letters and stuff. And then, yeah, I ended up getting this role. Um, mostly through recruiters. Uh, it's something I always suggest is to find all the tech recruiters uh, or tech, uh, I don't know what it's called, employment companies uh, locally and nationally and, and try to reach out to them. Cool. Anybody else have a different approach or something you want to share around how you structured your time? Um. I'll, I'll add something. Uh, me and Ben, when we graduated, was kind of like right at the start of the pandemic, which was kind of a weird time and somewhat similar to, I think, what a lot of people are going through now, where there's kind of been an economic downturn in tech and just doesn't feel like there's as many roles as there used to be. Um, I think what was kind of a good thing about the pandemic was there was kind of a galvanized um, community with everyone kind of being home. So there was like... Uh, hackathons and a lot of learning resources kind of offered free tiers of their stuff. So I kind of remember joining those hackathons and trying to take advantage of those free learning resources. So I think, and I'm not like a very well-structured human being. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't hold my feet to the fire super well. And even though I could, you know, do well with structure, I think, you know, sometimes having like a learning course that digest well not digest but like breaks out what I need to be doing each day kind of helps to provide that structure so if you're someone like me who is kind of almost paralyzed by you have so much free time how do you spend that free time I would say that like doing a good amount of self-learning is probably some of the best work you can do and I don't know I was trying to think like this might be segueing a little bit but like I think there's like, you know, what is the stuff that I should be learning stuff? You know, like, I think if you're targeting certain industries, like I know a lot of finance um, companies or at least like legacy finance companies are kind of built in older languages. I think that can sometimes be a good way to filter what to learn. But yeah, that, that would be, <laughs> be my answer is try and learn as much as possible while you have uh, still a lot of time. I think the only thing that I would say that is you know, like any different from anyone else's is that I spent maybe more time connection uh, messaging people or companies or industries that I wanted to be in that didn't necessarily have open role. Um, I don't think that that was inevitably what got me a full time job, but it definitely got me some internship opportunities along the way, which maybe was kind of the first step that I needed to get that full-time job. I think a lot of people are more open to the idea of bringing in a software engineer if the stakes are lower. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think that that was something that kind of helped boost my resume a little bit. 
Um, I went with like a very structured approach. Uh, I watched this thing that I just posted in the chat called your job is not advertised, but it's like a series of lectures that Jeff did back when Turing was in person. I suggest you watch them on like two times speed or whatever, but uh, he mentioned breaking up your day into uh, like palm periods of, well, what I did was an hour and a half of technical work, an hour and a half of research. So like finding jobs, um, an hour and a half of outreach, like applying to jobs and then also doing like networking and things like that. And then an hour and a half cleanup, which would be like, make sure your hunter board is up to date, doing follow-up for any jobs you've applied to. Um, and for me, who's kind of the opposite and is like very structured and scheduled, that was helpful because there are a lot of times where you're like, well, what do I do next? And I would keep a running list of like, for each category, what is something I can do here? And would never have those or very rarely have those periods of like, I have no idea what to do with my time anymore. So that worked for me. Awesome. Yeah, I think what I'm taking away from all of your answers is like, there's not one way to spend your time. I think having a plan is necessary, right? Um, but that plan might look different for each person. And so for those of you that are listening, I would like urge you to think about what what has your process been looking like? Is it working? For some of you, it has been working. You're feeling good. You're feeling like you're moving the needle. If it's not working, change it. Try something else that somebody mentioned. Um, and when we're thinking about like, Gavin, that was a great segue. There's kind of all these things that you need to balance, right? You need to keep your skills sharp. You need to actually be coding. You need to actually apply for things. And then you do need to network. And so that's kind of where I wanna break down this next set of questions um, is around like the coding piece. How did you, I heard some people mention like code challenges. I'd like to get really specific there of like, what were you actually working on when you were keeping your code skills sharp? Were you building projects? Were you doing more like um, code wars? Were you learning a new tech stack or were you really just like cementing what you learned at Turing? So I'd like to spend some time talking about what the coding piece of this looked like. Um, and Jim James, I'll start with you. What did that part of your um, job search look like? Yeah, I uh, I think if I remember correctly, I tried picking up GraphQL. I was doing these hackathons and then Turing at the time had kind of set up like mod five to be where you were in these like accountability groups. So you had like some partners that you were working with. And so you would kind of do a stand up, I think once a week and just kind of like give some kind of uh, update on what you've been working on. And so I remember trying to build a project with those guys. Um, I can kind of be a little bit, I don't know, unstructured as I already mentioned, um, but I also try and learn as much as possible, which is maybe like spreading yourself too thin. Um, one of the learning platforms I think was Udacity. They offered like a 30 day free trial. And so I remember trying to do their full stack developer course and I was able to finish that in time, but I was also trying to learn about AI at the time. So, you know, I think if I were to go back, I would maybe try and focus it in a little bit. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with learning or following what your interests are like leading you towards. Um, I think it can just be a matter of like, okay, you learned something this week, but are you gonna remember it by the end of the month? So how do you can like, how do you return to that material that you've learned? Um, I, I think right now there's some pretty good resources on front end masters that isn't necessarily front end specific, but if you've never signed up for front end masters, you can give them an email and you can get some other free courses. So um, I, think, I know one of them is on like data structures and algorithms, but I would say to try and like, what, what would be the most productive stuff? Honestly, now, like looking back three years, having worked in a role, I would say work on the fundamentals as much as possible because like that stuff more than like, you know, ooh, you kind of know GraphQL or you kind of know this, that stuff's gonna actually help way more and like make it easier to pick up the new stuff at your job because nothing is gonna prepare you that much for your new job. You're, you're kind of gonna have to learn things on the fly once you get hired. But I think if you have a strong foundation, it just makes it that much easier to, to move quickly when you get hired. Awesome. Gavin, what did technical prep look like for you? 
Um, well, I did a number of things given that it was a long job hunt, but um, I tried to mainly, uh, my my focus was to make sure that everything that I was doing, I had uh, like some way to demonstrate mastery of what I was working on. Um, I, I started doing that because I got like a, a Google Cloud certification um, and didn't notice any difference between before and after I had that on my resume. Um, and the things that I think did make a difference are I picked a project that I was going to have as like a showcase showcase project top of my resume where people could click on a link and see it deployed to like AWS or something like that or, or GCP. Uh, whatever it is, so that you could tell that I had those skills to understand deployment and also could code a website, you know. Um, and then also when I was working on things that are more behind the scenes that you couldn't really tell, right? I was working on serverless deployment. I wrote uh, a series of Medium articles on them uh, and posted them on my LinkedIn and uh, tried to bring that up as much as possible because that's, again, like if if you're working on things behind the scenes and you're learning them, and then you just write a line about that on your resume. That's, I think, less impactful than if you have, uh, like, on the internet, documented evidence that you have been putting in this work and that you're understanding the material. Um, so I, I lean more towards those dem demonstrable things more so than uh, doing the like, courses, for example. Awesome. Anyone else want to add to that? Um, I would say for me, I didn't really focus on learning anything new, like any new stack other than um, like a little bit of JavaScript since I did the backend program. But my thought process there was that um, kind of like uh, y'all had said, you don't really know what you're going to get hired to do. And so spending a ton of time and energy learning something new that you may or may not use definitely can show that you're able to learn. But I wanted to be able to just keep up on what I had learned already and be able to speak to it very like at a high level and um and show that I was able to that I really had a solid understanding of what I had learned um in Turing and so I did a combination of like solo Ruby projects going back through some of the other like old Turing curriculum um and then code challenge practice on like not leak code because I hate leak code um Code Wars, I think, and some other ones, but I always did it with a cohort mate. And that was really helpful to have somebody to hold you accountable of like, we're meeting, meeting on this day at this time to work on code stuff was really, really helpful for me. Um, I actually just focused on the learning aspect and sharpening my like learning skills and like the ability to take over your fundamentals into different languages. So I actually did tutorials for Python, for Go, for PHP. Like I just tried to find the similarities because kind of like what everyone else has said is, is like, you don't know what you're gonna work in and you shouldn't just apply for jobs that are in the languages you know. Like you're applying for entry level if you're this is your first job and so no one expects you to be experts in anything, like even in the languages you're putting on your resume. And they're like, my company didn't even expect me to start really producing work for like two months um they were impressed when I was able to contribute faster but like there wasn't that high expectation of like need to perform immediately um so I yeah just kind of focused on the learning so I learned pretty much anything I could because one of my favorite quotes from or at least I don't I'm not 100% positive because I'm not really great at this but I, I heard this quote is basically don't memorize anything you can look up I spend more time on Google than anything so like this idea that you're going to like learn something new and then like retain it. So like, you know, it so well, it's like in your brain forever. It's no, if you stop using it, you lose it. Uh, at least that's my opinion. Um, so I focus more on like, can I learn? Can I demonstrate that even if I like, once I stop the tutorial, can I make changes to the code that I want to, you know, once I'm done with the bare, like the basics, it's like, can I edit it? Like, can I write something that's similar, but that's on my own? And do I understand what I'm doing? You know, I'm not just like, going through the motions and not copy and pasting. Um, so that's kind of like what I focused on and not so much like language specific stuff. Um, but I did the same thing, frameworks, libraries. Um, you know, I did a CLI tool in Node and I learned more about Bash and customized my Bash profiles like a ton. Um, basically anything I could do to like more into just the developer role in general as well. Awesome. Uh, the other side, right, besides coding is networking, which we talk about a lot, 
but like, what does networking actually look like? Or what did it look like for all of you? And I know like Jim, James and Ben, you went through the program in person with me, but then we graduated into a very remote world when the pandemic hit. And so I would assume that almost all of the networking for all five of you was probably still set in a remote world, even though we didn't all go through remote Turing. So I'd love to hear, and Ben, I'll start with you because you had mentioned networking specifically. What does networking, what did it look like for you? Um, how did you make connections with other people? Yeah, I kind of wish there was like maybe multiple avenues that I could talk about. I, I would say like predominantly everything I did was based on LinkedIn. Um, I think that essentially basically like for me i always wanted to work in either like the outdoor industry or some sort of mapping space or just like past interests that i'd had before um so i you know looked up companies that operated in that space um usually i'd go to their website and maybe there'd be like a employee list somewhere that i could find um so that i knew kind of generally who to look for on linkedin you could also find a the company there but sometimes they don't always match up and like who's who. Um, so it was just nice to like have that information from both spots. Um, and then I kind of like had a decently tailored what is it, 150 character or less message that I would try and send out to um, not as many people as I could, but like kind of targeted people within each organization. Um, just explaining like, hey, I honestly, most of mine weren't job oriented towards the end. It was more like, how does it feel to be a software engineer within the outdoor industry space? Or how much, you know, like mapping do you actually do? Is it more dashboard? Kind of like uh, job specific questions that people are more interested to talk about, I think were usually more successful. Cool. Did anybody else like leverage networking and what's it that look like for you? Um, I networked a ton. I honestly focused way more on that um, than anything else. Um, and I found the role that I had. This is my first job out of Turing um, through a Turing alumni. And I, if y'all aren't using Ada.com for jobs yet, that is really great um, for sending you job recommendations and you can set a bunch of preferences for the kind of jobs you're looking for. Um, so I had seen a job on auto that I was interested in. I looked the company up on um, LinkedIn and saw that there were five Turing grads there. I messaged them all similarly, um, had like a message kind of ready. And um, the one thing also I would encourage y'all to do when you're networking is have questions ready, do your homework, have like specific company questions, specific role questions, like don't make them work to talk to you. Like you need to engage, you need to be like, I'm super excited. Even if you're not that excited, just have some questions ready and make it easy to schedule. Pick day, you know, give them like, a, hey, does any of these times between these days work for you? Like make it the easiest you can for the people you're trying to network with um, and have questions ready to ask them and be engaging. Um, I actually, like I said, the job that I got she said she'd spoken to some other people about it that weren't very engaging and just expected a referral because they had gone to Turing and she was not impressed by that. So just make sure you're like really putting forth some effort to do your research when you're networking. Um, Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I was just going to say that I think Deanna nailed it with like being prepared for your um, networking meetings, like doing at least 15 minutes of research, looking them up on LinkedIn, seeing their experience. And I would always write down questions um, and you don't have to follow them exactly. Like sometimes you just get into like, you know, get into a vibe and you can just chat for 15 minutes. And that's great as well, because that's how you convince somebody that you'd be great to work with is if you can just like have a conversation with them. Um, but being prepared is important. But another aspect for me was just like, and I, you know, I got um, referrals to jobs that weren't posted this way is just like participating in donuts channels, 
reaching out to alumni who, you know, you may not have a reason, you just think their work experience is interesting and you want to talk to them about it and find out more about what they're doing in their day to day. Like the more you give yourself opportunities to, to meet people, the more um, those opportunities will turn up. So just being consistent about it and like not only when it's a position that you really want, but just like all the time, just being an open person. So, yeah. Yeah, I I completely agree on that. I think having been in a couple of interviews on the opposite side, um, it's kind of interesting how, even though there's not really any like concrete thing you could say about why maybe one interview was better than the other, I think kind of that body language type aspect can come through um kind of an interesting like not totally related but an interesting thing i thought recently or heard recently was kind of in regards to negotiation like when you go to your employer with kind of a yes no binary being like i want to raise because all these other people i know have gotten raises you kind of force them into a position where they're either going to say yes or no and i think kind of in the same vein when you're trying to reach out to people whether that's through linkedin and it's completely cold or it's going up to someone at a networking event. I think if you come in with kind of the expectation or just like the sentiment that they owe you something or that, you know, you would love to have a job with them, can they help you out? People will kind of be reluctant, I think, and might pull back, which is unfortunate, but I think it's just kind of a knee jerk reaction. And in some ways not being like clever, but just being a little bit more tactful. I think you could be like, hey, like I noticed you have a similar background that I do. You're working in an industry that I would love to work in. And I'd love to just find out how you got hired at the role that you got hired on. Like people will always talk about themselves, but if you overextend, I mean, if you know the person super well, sure, go for it, ask for, you know, maybe a a referral. But I think the first, first interactions or until you have like a bit of a correspondence going back and forth, it shouldn't be asking for a referral or being asked to you know be interviewed for the job but um kind of different different note i i also did an internship uh similar to ben um and i would say that from that internship i had at least two i had one my mentor tried to get me hired at his company after he left the one that i interned at i had another guy that i had loosely worked with who tried to bring me on at some place um which i think Internships are very valuable, not only for what you learn, but I think the people that you work with kind of can set you up with future career opportunities. And if you can't really get that internship opportunity, I think similar to like working or going to a meetup regularly, like one time isn't gonna move the needle much, but if you go there every month and you meet those people often and build that relationship, then I think it has a higher chance of paying dividends. Awesome. Yeah. I, also, as somebody who I, when I got my first job, um, I had folks reaching out to me from Turing who wanted to network with me. And some of them did end up getting hired at my company. Uh, but one of the things that I appreciated that folks would do is they would tell me what their questions were ahead of time. You know, they'd come out to me on Slack and say, hey, here are some things that I'm wondering about. And sometimes if I didn't have time to get on a call with them, I would just answer them over Slack. We'd kind of go back and forth for a couple of days and then time would open up and I'd be able to talk to them on Zoom. And so um, I just want to encourage folks to like, it doesn't always have to be um, synchronous on Zoom to talk to someone. You can still gain a lot of their perspective if you just start a conversation over LinkedIn or chat or um, Slack. Cool. I'm going to open this question up to anyone because I, I don't know if it will pertain to everyone, but... Did anybody have the gap in time between graduation and interviewing for your job? Did anybody have that get brought up in an interview? Um, and if so, like, how did you address that? And I think it, I'm seeing some head shakes, which is also telling. Did anybody have that come up? Okay. That's actually great because I think that's a fear that some of our job seekers have is um, that they're going to have to explain away, like, why do you have 10 months of time where you, there's a gap on the resume? And so I think it's telling that none of you had that pop up. Does anybody want to add to that or say anything about that? Um, I was going to say the only 
way I think that'd pop up is if they wanted to like look at your GitHub history and it was like blank for 10 months, or if they wanted to look at, you know, like what have you been doing for the last 10 months and there was like nothing to show that you were like doing anything in the field, maybe. But honestly, I don't think that's going to be a problem unless it's like starts to go into multiple years um, where you have like just nothing. And so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about that. Never a question I'm ever asking if I have to interview. I would also add, even with that, that like, I, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think anyone has really gone to my GitHub unless I like explicitly called something out on it. And in addition, most of the work I've been doing recently is on Bitbucket. So you would see zero green squares for a very long time. Yeah, to second that, um, I work on a private instance of GitLab, so I haven't really written any GitHub commits in a long time. And I have a friend who is a engineering manager, and he's pretty much told me the same, that he's not checking to see GitHub commits every day as a way of, you know, assessing whether or not a candidate is good or bad. Um, I have checked out some projects and I think kind of in those initial interviews and tech challenges, those are maybe a bit more telling than, uh, you know, a Git project because things change and I think it's just hard to try and assess any kind of, you know, certainty. Someone else could have written the project, you know, there's not, there's not a whole lot you can glean from it. But um, I did in a separate time in a separate industry when I was looking for a sales job, I had someone bring attention to gaps in my work history. And it was in particular that I had like switched companies pretty regularly. And when I didn't get the job, I think a lot of times this is not necessarily towards the getting asked this in an interview, but I think a lot of times during the interview process, you might get a rejection and not get any feedback as to why you got that rejection. And that's a very frustrating part of the process. This guy who I interviewed with was, um, nice enough to give me kind of straight up feedback that he was like you're a red flag in the sense of like you're a flight risk you're gonna just leave after a couple months when it gets tough um which i took offense to but i also was appreciative of in the sense that you know this is what someone's opinion of me was i think expecting that out of employers or you know potential employers um is going to be hard but i think it's also in the way that you phrase it and kind of just being tactful like what did i do wrong can be phrased and how could I have done better? You know, trying to frame things in the positive versus the negative um, speaks to kind of the tone of the, the conversation. No one wants to be the bad guy, but they are also trying to protect themselves from any kind of liability, I guess. Yeah, I saw in the chat, so someone did mention that it's come up a couple of times for them in the job search that there's a gap in the resume. Does anybody have advice for students who it might pop up like, hey, you know, what's been going on for the past X number of months? How could somebody field that question? I got that question um, once um, in sort of all the interviews. So I don't think it's super common, but as long as you have like things that you're working on that are on your resume, then you can show that off and you can say, this is what I've been working on and it looks super cool because I've been working on it. Um, and just as a tangent related to Git commits, um, I created a, a GitHub Actions workflow to automatically push commits to my commit history. So anybody who looks at my uh, GitHub is gonna see just a giant wall of green regardless. And you can do this like, for going back like years, if you want, like you can pretend that you've been committing a bunch, but it's a silly way for people to judge you. Um, so I just make sure it's a wall of green regardless. So if they're going to judge me in a silly way, at least they're going to think it's good. I love that. Uh, can I, can I, uh, add to that? Uh, I was going to put in the chat that it's come up a couple of times and it yeah. for me. Um, uh, it actually first originally came up in like, uh, I go to a lot of uh, community dev meetups in my uh, city in DFW. Um, and every now and then they do these like huge panels of like, um, 
uh, mock interviews uh, from actual developers in the field. And um, that was one of the questions that someone had asked me. They had known that I was a recent um, uh, bootcamp grad. And actually their, their question was like, what do I plan to do? What have I been planning to do with my time since I've graduated um, into like um, hopefully landing their role job um, or my, like, my job essentially. And I didn't really have an answer. Like I knew what I wanted to do as far as like, well, I want to get a job. Uh, I have all this knowledge um, and I'm just like, I don't know, uh, working on projects and stuff like that. And I realized that was a really good answer. Um, I talked with her a little bit afterwards and she says like, you know, a lot of people go through coding boot camps and it's great. It's such a, a, a wonderful t- a feat to go through, but it's also like, um, what are you doing with what you learned at Turing or whichever uh, boot camp you went to? Like, how are you applying that knowledge? Um, and I realized like what that meant after going through a couple of interviews when I was kind of asked that question, it's not about like basically making projects. Um, I realized that I could make projects and like that's cool and all, but I guess what I want to do is also increase my knowledge base. So like I'm, I'm learning things or I'm increasing the foundation of what uh, Turing has taught me. Um, and like good examples of doing that, instead of just doing projects, like I'm, I do presentations for my developer community. Um, I'm doing presentations at other boot camps. Um, like find a way to, or being a mentor here in a, like uh, Turing channels or anywhere else in your community or wherever. I think those are also good ways to, um, if the question is brought up, like, you know, what have you been doing since you've been graduating? Like, well, I've been, I've been, I've been busy. This is what I've been doing besides just doing projects. Like, I think projects is cool to like um, flex, but I, um, I guess where I, I feel like I've gotten the best uh, reaction and um, best feedback from is by like uh, speaking to that, uh, I'm taking that knowledge and, and spreading it to other people. Uh, that helps kind of solidify my foundation of what I've learned um, in other ways than just doing projects. That's just my two cents. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I love that. And I think like Gavin, you had mentioned that you were writing like medium articles about the things that you had learned. And so, yeah, any, any way that you can talk about applying that knowledge, um, there's only so much you can say if you're like, I watched a couple tutorials about Python or whatever it is, but if you're able to speak to what you did with it, and there's a million things that you could do with it, I do think that is just an inter- more interesting story to tell in an interview. I think a lot of interviewing is just telling really good stories and connecting. And so trying to think about what is the thing that you're learning, what is the thing you're working on, and then how do you tell that story? And to someone else in an interesting way that forms a connection. Cool. Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, Jim James. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think it, it, it does kind of depend on like how you answer it, because I feel like that's an unfair question, depending on like the like intent behind the question. Like if they're trying to get you for not having gotten a job, that's pretty mean spirited. And I would be kind of not interested in working in a place like that. So assuming that they mean good intentions, how could you like reverse engineer, like what would be the best kind of answer? And I think trying to give it in the sense of like, if you, I guess like well, reverse engineer, what would be a bad answer? A bad answer is like, well, I've, you know, I haven't gotten a job, so I've just been, you know, trying to get a job. Can you give me a job? You know, like that's true to an extent those you know those things can be true but I don't think it conveys the best you know it doesn't convey the whole truth of you you know you've been working on projects you've been learning these things you've been going to these meetups what about those things have been the most exciting thing I think the reality is that everyone at some point has been on an extended job search or has been through the job search and understands that it's a slog and so I don't think anyone would be like critical of anyone for having not gotten a job but i think there's also an element of self accountability where if you aren't putting in the work in and you aren't trying that that will kind of extend your job search and that could come through in an interview so i think so long as you're doing the work be honest to yourself and be honest in the interview and i think that will speak to more links than i don't know 
overthinking the answer or, or feeling like you need to have some kind of explanation for why you've been on the job search for so long. Awesome. One question that showed up several times, and I'm again going to throw this to the larger group to anybody who wants to answer this, but how did you support yourself financially while you were going through the job search? I know we have a lot of folks who have picked up part-time and full-time positions and are trying to balance those jobs with the job search. So can anybody speak to that side of things? Um, Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ben. Oh, Anna and then Ben. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. So I come from a service industry background, and I was lucky enough to be able to just pick up shifts at, um, the brewery that I had been working at, and they were really flexible. And also because that was nights nice and weekends, that left me, um, the kind of nine to four Turing type schedule to do job hunt, code networking, all that good stuff. So, um, that's and that was the place I had been working before touring. So I just went, went right back as soon as I graduated. Yeah. And I think similarly, um, I, in the past I worked in climbing gyms. Uh, so I picked up like a few, maybe like a few days a week at the local gym, um, and worked those shifts. I also was on food stamps at the time too. So that kind of like helped to alleviate a lot of that pressure. Um, once I got into like the internship realm, I just stayed on those because those were a little bit lower paying as well. Um, it definitely was like, it had to be a scrappier time for sure. But like picking up a job here or there, even if it's not coding, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, I also think it's just at like, just if you are have another job and you put that on your resume or you let them know, like I've been working, that kind of explains what you've been doing with your time. If it, it's like leading to the other question as well, so you don't have time to do all this extra stuff. You, that's your answer is like, I've been working, I'm doing my, you know, it's like, I'm working and interviewing and like, to me, that would be a good enough answer. Cause it shows that you're, you know, you obviously have to take care of your, your own stuff on top of it. Um, but yeah, I mean. I ended up getting like a job, like an internship where they let me apply for jobs during the day. Like that was like two hours of my days. I'd actually get mentorship for like job applications. So I kind of got lucky there. Um, but if you need to get a job, I don't think it's not a bad thing. Well, yeah. I, oh, I was just going to say that I, I was picking up shifts as well. And like there's, you're going to have more limited time to work on you know, all the things that you want to do, but you just have to prior prioritize like what is going to be the most impactful thing. I think, you know, so like jobs where you have a connection, you might apply to fewer jobs, but the jobs where you have a higher likelihood because you have a connection or you have a touring alumni there. Um, and just takes a little bit of prioritization, but it's a struggle, man. <laughs> all these long, long job hunts, like, yeah. I also think it's a where like I started switching to like just applying to jobs and playing the numbers game is also a strategy you can take is like if you don't have the time to meaningfully like fill out a custom cover letter fill out a custom resume for each job like you can just start submitting resumes like you don't need to necessarily fill that out for every job like sometimes you know you'll you'll get those without it and then again those recruiter companies that I referenced as well like you can reach out to the staffing companies um, that work with tech world, like they will take your resume and also help you job hunt when you can't. Um, and those are also ways to like really get your name out there. You know, it's like you can do your work and then they will find you a job because that's how they get paid. So that actually reminded me, I think I saw like a TikTok or something, and I'm not sure if this is old news or new news, but apparently there's like a LinkedIn feature that if you go to a company's like profile page and then go to their about section. They typically will have like a like toggle button that will say like, can you notify me of future opportunities? And so that way recruiters for that company will then go and look at the job opportunities they have available. And if you match with those requirements, they'll reach out to you, which is kind of like a, you know, less intensive way of applying to jobs, or at least, you know, I think putting the ball in their court, so to speak, because I think it can be kind of hard to try and apply for jobs that you're not quite sure if you have a fit for. Um, and I think, yeah, as, as much as possible, when you do see a job opportunity, try and get in touch with the like job poster or recruiter. Um, 
you know. Um, and, and also when you're doing, uh, just like to follow up the numbers game, it don't look for jobs that are necessarily just entry level. Um, my mentor told me anything from like zero up to three years is like very potential for entry level people, uh, developers, you can get them. They're normally written by HR people is what I was always told. And even my company here, like we write HR writes the ads, but the developers who actually do the interviewing don't even care about like what's written in the ad, um, like at all. And they're usually the ones who pick the candidates. Um, so like zero to three, and then I've even applied to years with five, um, up to five for job companies I really wanted to work at. And I did get a couple interviews there and I got good feedback from them. Like they, they were like, you barely got beaten out because there was a candidate who happened to be like perfect for the job, which happened like twice. And then one where I got disqualified for a uh, difference in knowledge, uh, like schooling backgrounds. Yeah, I had a similar experience. Um, somebody connected me with a job. They were like, you should apply for this. And it was a senior role. And I was like, I'm not a senior developer. I just graduated from Turing. And they were like, no, no, no. Like they just post senior roles, but they'll basically like, they'll find their best fit. And then they'll like tell you what level you are. So they only post senior roles. And then if you're a good match, they'll offer you the junior position. And I was like, that is so bizarre, <laughs> but it does, it happens. Um, and that was a major Denver-based company. So um, that one was Guild. So just know that like companies do that. Don't be afraid, don't count yourself out. Don't, I always say like, I'm not gonna tell myself no, I'm gonna let somebody else tell me no. So just apply anyway. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, you go. No, no, no. I was just going to to add on to that. Um, the company that I worked at, like they put out a job listing that was like, it'd be nice if this person had React experience, if they had Python experience, if they had like a, a master's or PhD in chemistry, that'd be cool. Some C++. And they're like, it was the most unrealistic job application. And I'm like talking to my, my boss about it as he's putting it out there. And it's a straight up front end role. Like that's all it was supposed to be. Like the React experience was really the only thing um so really take some of that stuff with a grain of salt i think sometimes when you see just a laundry list of requirements and stuff don't take that to heart because that's just the most unrealistic thing ever even people that are you know time, with years and years of experience could not be that well accomplished but um yeah i don't know yeah no one of my favorite things i saw on linkedin when i was applying for jobs is the creator i believe a fast api I had taken a screenshot of a job requirements where they required um, like 10 years of fast API experience. And he made this whole joke. He's like, I can't even apply for the tech I created because it's only seven years old. So yeah. That's such a good example. Uh, yeah, Gabrielle, I see you have a question. Hey, um, I'm hearing a lot of really supportive comments about applying for roles even though it seems like you're not qualified for whatever sec for whatever reason that is but i'm wondering how you balance that out with uh companies using uh how do you say it? like ai kind of websites to filter through resumes and cover letters and whatnot ats thanks joe yeah ats um i can i jump in sorry to come right back in but I actually was listening to a LinkedIn like podcast episode and it was like talking with a recruiter who kind of dispelled the notion of ATS software because I think I think by law they're required to do it I think for the most part what ATS will filter out is whether or not you're a U.S. citizen because that depends on like whether the company can offer a visa sponsorship as far as like requirements go I think that legitimately does have to be screened by a human person and typically the like way that she broke it down was how she filters through resumes was first thing she looks at is experience, which is unfortunate, like years of experience primarily. And then like what kind of experience that was and then kind of filter into like education and then kind of extracurriculars on top of that. I'll see if I can try and find the podcast episode, but it was a bit reassuring to know that like, you know, you're not getting any kind of reply back because this, you know, bot decided that your resume wasn't any good. Um, but I don't know. I, I think if you can get in touch with a recruiter at, at the very least, that can kind of dispel that kind of sentiment, I think. Um, sometimes people are just busy and don't respond. Um, 
Yeah. Um, I would just kind of add on that, even if like, say that that is happening, you have an, like a system that's kicking out your resume. Um, I mean, you probably like, there's no way of telling whether or not that's going to happen. That could be happening with your resume, even for the jobs you do qualify for experience wise. You're like, I would not, again, kind of like what Kayla was saying is like, don't take a no until someone tells, you no. like, don't assume it's a no. Don't assume the software is kicking you out. Kind of assume that you're getting applied, that someone's looking at your resume. Because if you worry about all the reasons why you're not going to, like get through to the recruiter, like, like that's, that's going to count. Like you're going to start not applying to a ton of jobs that they might take you. And so like, that's, that's going to hurt you more than if say like 90% of the companies even had the software and it was actually doing this and it's like a waste of time. Um, that's where like, for me, it's like, whenever I applied to a job that I thought was like way out of my qualifications, I didn't do more than a resume. I literally did like quick apply. I literally did the bare minimum because it was like, shot in the dark maybe they take me maybe they don't or if it was for a company that was like this is my dream job this is like the company that i will work for for the rest of my life if i get this job then i would take some extra time so it's like i kind of balanced it out that way where it's like don't spend too much time if you're that if that's something you're afraid of but still apply like just getting a resume in there could get you a job i'd also even add that uh the like don't take no until it's no sometimes you can like not even take no when it is a no i had a couple interviews that like one was this in my mind not very important uh like personality exam where you had to you know pair all these different traits of a person with what you thought resounded with you um uh, and so like afterwards i sent a message to uh the recruiter like hey i don't know what the results of this are going to be but i'm assuming the worst <laughs> i don't know <laughs> uh, and so i th just kind of like said like i would love to keep going um even if this isn't a possibility and that's why i like linked my github and it's like i am like capable and i've worked with other people um and that actually got me skipped to the next round of interview on that one and i've even had that for like some other technical challenges where i fail uh and like don't i have them nothing to send in i can say like hey you know i i did x y and z i was attempting to do this didn't get there uh maybe didn't get close but this was kind of the thought process behind it and just kind of like not necessarily accepting that no has helped me get through a couple of steps. Cool. Yeah. And I, I will also speak to like, um, when I was working, not at Turing, we had some people applying and I had someone that I had experience with and really really wanted to advocate for her. I thought she was gonna just be so strong on the team and she had gotten automatically filtered out and was in the no pile and I advocated for her to get moved into the yes pile and so I I think that human connection of knowing someone because if you have a human person advocating for you to move you out of the pile that the AI tool or whatever tool um, pulled you into the no pile for that is so powerful so make a human connection any chance you can um, because you never know who's going to advocate for you and you know you'll never know if you are ever in a no pile <laughs> but what matters is like that you get to the next round and a human is going to be more likely to help you get into that yes pile than a computer um Okay, I want to close this out because we've got four minutes left and this question popped up a lot. And so I do want to make sure that we spend some time with it. So we'll close with this question. Long job hunts. Job hunts are hard, even when they're short. And so how did you maintain motivation? How did you deal with the disappointment or any of the, the fears, the imposter syndrome, any of those feelings? How did you like maintain the motivation? to get through it and to ultimately get that job. Gavin, I'll have you go first. Um, I, I mean, just to start out with, I would say that like, there's like, there's nothing wrong with you. Like, it's all right. Like, um, this is something that a lot of very successful people have gone through, like long job hunts. Um, and I think there can be a lot of shame and like you sort of start to disengage from the community and start to feel embarrassed when people are asking like, you know, 
how the job hunt is going and you have to give the same response like for months and months and months in a row and it gets really disheartening and anybody who's going through that i want you to know like been there before i feel for you like it sucks um and this will be over eventually like i believe y'all got it um but um yeah i mean just stay engaged with the community is the best thing that i can say is like you know talk to people who are in the same situation like exchange notes like take advantage of the new grad services people they're they're actually great they'll give you one-on-one -on -one feedback they'll give you great advice um and yeah just talk to people be there for each other um yep definitely echo what gavin said i actually didn't take care like take advantage of the training services until like the end where it's like i can do this for a while on my own and then it, it just failed spectacularly so the training services are super helpful just talking to your like to, to your cohort mates really do some self-care like if you need to take a, a day off of applying and just go get a drink go go listen to some music read a book go to a park get outside like make sure you do that self-care part like it doesn't have to be so like an activity that costs money if, if that's something that's like tight but like it's fine to take a day off and like the long scheme of things like those seven jobs like the odds that those were the seven jobs or the 10 jobs or whatever that was going to get you a role as opposed to the mental health aspect that will deteriorate slowly if you're not taking care of yourself and how that will affect if you do get an interview like if you're already kind of going in hopeless like that can be seen um like pretty easily uh so just make sure you're taking care of yourself you know take a bath whatever i don't know whatever you do to relax do it don't make sure you don't stop i know it's really hard to to be like you know this is super important it's urgent you know i have to get a job I'm, my money's running out rent's due and it's like this urgent feeling that you're like i can't relax i can't do like some self-love and i i give that advice to everyone i've ever talked to is like if you don't you will suffer more like if you can take a day off you'll maybe come back at it with a fresh set ready to go again harder than you did before but if you just keep burning yourself out you'll want to quit it'll be like on the back of your mind every day it's like why am i still doing this and so don't forget to take care of yourselves like it, it gets rough and then and then the other piece of advice for that is like always set expectations it can take up to like we're all here because it took us up to like six months or three months or whatever it took us a long time to find a job this isn't just you like your expectations are just it could take up to this amount of time or maybe even longer like don't be like oh it's been like two months like, like i saw that a lot in the train chat like a while ago when i decided to start getting involved it's like everyone was downtrodden they've been like searching for like two three months and it's like i feel you like it sucks then too but it's like if your expectations are that it could take you a really long time it will help you if you go into it like there's nothing wrong if you don't, if it takes six months, like don't, like uh, Gavin was saying, there's nothing wrong with taking a long time. And, and same with like with, it's just like everyone goes through this. It's sometimes people get lucky and sometimes you, it's like playing the lottery. You know, it's like someone won and it just didn't happen to be you. And yeah. And I also think it's fine, just like another piece of advice to check out sometimes of the group channels that are like showing successes in jobs. Cause sometimes it can also be like really, I don't know if, for everyone but for me like seeing everyone else who's succeeding in my cohort at towards the end was really weighing on me it's like something is clearly it's like it's, it is on me so sometimes like taking a, a break from the community can also be helpful if you're getting downtrodden because of other people's successes which sounds mean and petty but it it can happen like my my fiance said it the best is like being surrounded by six like happy people when you're not can be more like can really make you feel even worse um so self-care self-love all of that Awesome. We are at 301. So if you have to drop, that's totally fine. But I do want to give y'all like, I feel like this is a good question. And so I want to give everybody a chance to answer it if you're able to stay. Um, but yeah, if you want to keep answering stay, if you got to drop, that's fine too. Um, I just, I want to echo what Kyle said. Um, Self-care is really important. If you need a day off, if you need a week off and you can take it, take it. I personally had a really hard time coming down from the Turing, like you have to be doing this 80 hours a week mindset. Like I, had a, I, had, I think I'm actually finally just now <laughs> starting to get past all that. Um, so yeah, don't like try to get those voices that are like, you're not doing enough. You need to do this more to just be quiet and take time and do what makes you happy when you need those days. Cause I agree with everything he said for um, showing up to interviews, showing up with a, a good attitude the next day sometimes it's really important to just take a day off
Yeah, I uh, I definitely had some dark moments. I remember I'd gone through a couple of interviews and made it to the final round a couple of times only to like lose out. And sometimes that was against my peers, which I can agree is definitely bittersweet because you you want to celebrate the people around you. I think people will kind of, you know, remember how you treated them when they were on top. And it, it can be hard to say, but as soon as you're in that position, it's actually the sweetest thing to get congratulations from people. So, um, yeah, I swear to God, I remember I was talking to Allison and I was like, it's, it's not, it's not the like, the knowledge I have, it's, it's my soul. It's, it's who I am as a person. <laughs> That's why I'm getting rejected, which is very dramatic, you know, very dramatic, which I can sometimes be, but like, I think um, one quote I heard recently that was like about shame is like shame is believing that there is something wrong with you. Like when someone says like, oh, you did something wrong and you feel shamed. It's because you believe that you're a bad person and you do bad things. There is nothing about not getting a job that has any real indication of the kind of skill or talent that you have. And I think one thing that kind of reassured me and, and made me believe this was that there's this book called like algorithms to live by that like applies computer science principles to like real life principles. And one of the examples they give is on the topic of hiring. And like when you can optimize, you know, how many people you interview and you know, how quickly you make a decision, like what are the best odds that you hire the best candidate? And it was like 37%, which is less than a coin toss. That I think just should really, you know, be something you keep in mind when going into these interviews like it could be it could be that they closed the job it could be that they didn't hire anyone I had that happen to me a couple of times where just like the budget for the job disappeared we hired at our company we opened up positions but then didn't end up hiring for a while so it wasn't like any of the people we interviewed at that time weren't good we didn't hire any of them you know it was just business needs changed um I think too when I got to the job that I ended up getting I kind of had given up hope in the way. And, and I mean it almost in the kind of a, I guess I'd accepted that I probably wasn't going to get this job. I think maybe if I were to like be a little critical on myself and how I was coming across in some of my other interviews, maybe I was being too eager or earnest and maybe that was spilling off. But I think I kind of had a calm resignation that I wasn't going to get the job that somehow led to me getting the job. I'm not sure if that is helpful or not, but uh, be kind to yourself. I can, I can be really hard to myself and it really doesn't help much. And I think whatever you're saying to yourself is probably way worse than any interviewer is saying about you, you know? So it's, it's nothing like just keep getting in there. Like the amount of opportunities you have versus how many times you're told no, I think you always you're going to have more opportunities and there are going to be lots of no's but eventually you'll get yeses so just focus on getting those opportunities no pressure ben but you're the big finale here oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> i was like i got two sentences we're good out uh i mean i think just setting yourself up to minimize uh stressors for me was like a big part like i knew that my partner had actually just gone through it too. So she had a job, but we still had essentially a year's worth of me supporting her before that. Uh, so we were like still kind of catching up, I guess. And so just for me, I guess money was a stressor. So I got a part-time job and that helped. Um, I signed up for a gym membership, even though I money was a stressor and that helped because I didn't do any of that in touring. Um, so I just, like, I think taking the time to like systematically tackle the things that are making your life more unhappy, um, to really the only thing that's left is the actual job hunt, I think is like a good thing to do too. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, and thanks for sticking around seven minutes late. Um, thanks for everybody that joined and submitted questions when you bought a ticket. And for those of you who unmuted with questions, that was really great. Um, I will share this recording. I'll share all of our panelists Slack handles um, in the new grad services channel after this. It usually takes like 10 minutes for my computer to get the recording. But yeah, in about 15 minutes, you'll get a post from me um, with their information. But that's it. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you all around. Bye.